Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is Iran's nuclear program, and the big question for today's lecture is why aren't talks with Iran going anywhere? If you've read the news in the last five years, you would know that Iran is developing a nuclear program, and while Iran claims that this is for purely scientific and sort of nuclear energy purposes, no one in the West believes this, and everyone in the West believes that Iran ultimately wants to develop a nuclear weapon. And so in the last few years, the United States and the West has tried to negotiate with Iran to offer some sort of concessions to Iran to convince Iran not to continue developing a nuclear weapon or going down the nuclear line, and this has ultimately gone nowhere. So we want to understand why this is the case. And to do that, we need to learn about a bit of history here. And this is probably going to be a review for you if you've been paying attention to the international relations world in the last 10 years. But we're going to start almost exactly 10 years ago today. On March 20th, 2003, this is when the United States invades Iraq and very quickly throws Saddam Hussein out of power and takes over the country. Less than a month and a half later, George W. Bush lands on the USS Abraham Lincoln and gives the now infamous Mission Accomplished speech. This is where we declare Mission Accomplished in Iraq. And of course, with hindsight being 2020, we know that this was a little bit premature and, you know, Bush ultimately has to regret giving this speech, knowing what we know now about the insurgency. But we'll get to that in a moment. Because two days later, two days after this mission accomplished speech, the Swedish ambassador who's stationed in Iran delivers a path to peace document to Washington, D.C., to the Bush administration. So the United States doesn't have any official diplomatic relations with Iran since the Iranian hostage crisis, if you've seen that in Argo. Well, we still need some sort of unofficial diplomatic relations. So the Swedish attache in Tehran does that for us. So the Swedish ambassador who stationed in Iran flew out to DC, handed this document to the Bush administration. And I want you to think about what this document says, because if it were to appear on Washington DC's doorstep tomorrow, it would be magical Christmas land there. This is a miracle offer. It's essentially a white flag from Iran. So Iran offered to end its nuclear weapons program. It offered assistance against Al-Qaeda. It offered to end its aid to Hezbollah, and it even offered to recognize Israel. And all the demands that Iran had in return were to reinitialize full diplomatic relations and have a prisoner swap. So these were very minimal demands and a lot of things that the United States would really want, especially now today. What was the Bush administration's response to this? Well, again, in retrospect, this is going to be shocking. There was no response. And in fact, the party line was, we don't talk to evil. And there's no need to negotiate with Iran. We're in such a position of strength. We just overran Iraq. We don't need to negotiate any sort of agreement with Iran when we can just strong arm, strong arm them and get what we want. Well, this turned out, again, now with hindsight being 2020, to be a bit of a disaster. So at the time in Iran, a moderate held the presidency. And of course, the presidency in Iran doesn't really hold so much power as opposed to the Ayatollah. But nevertheless, the president does hold some sort of unofficial power and is able to influence international relations. And so at the time we had, or Iran had a moderate in power, and the moderates in power developed this document that was sent to the Bush administration. And they were the ones championing uh, restoring diplomatic relations between the United States and Iran. And they got the Ayatollah to sign off on this document, to, to give it his blessing before they sent it over to D.C. Well, when Bush doesn't respond, this causes upheaval domestically in Iran, at least politically, in that the moderates are the ones who look really, really bad that this went nowhere because they were the ones who had the idea to do this in the first place. And so what happens is that in the next presidential election, some of the moderates get banned from the ballot. And so guess what? Ahmadinejad wins, right? And so this is where diplomatic relations officially turn pretty poor because we, instead of having a moderate in Iran, are now faced down with Ahmadinejad, who is a lot more intransigent. Well, fast forward about four years later, President Obama becomes, well, the president of the United States, and we start trying to push for diplomatic talks once again. And so you have Bush, or rather Bush leaving office, Obama entering office, trying to restart the relationship, trying to restart the dialogue, and guess what? Iran doesn't listen. Why is that? Well, we have to learn about something that happened in the meantime. So in the meantime, about 
three months after that mission accomplished speech is when the Iraq civil war begins in earnest. This is when you start getting the UN bombed and all sorts of other uprisings happening in Iran, or rather in Iraq. And this is when the United States starts to lose the Iraq war. And this is bad because it looked like in May 2003 that everything was going to be fine and the United States had the strength to do whatever it wanted to in the world. And what we learned maybe five years from then is that, in fact, the United States is much weaker in terms of actually being able to handle an insurgency and that sort of thing than anyone thought was the case back in, in May of 2003. So in the May of 2003, the United States is essentially at the pinnacle of its power in the 21st century. And after that, during the Iraq war, we're sort of on the downhill swing, right, where we looked like we were able to just bully everyone in May of 2003, but by by certainly 2007, 2008, the United States is suffering from war exhaustion and is just unwilling to engage in further conflicts. So how does this relate to the bargaining situation? Well, we need to think about this in terms of what we talked about in the last lecture. So we had four different outcomes based off of the cost of nuclear weapons and the extent of the power shift. For this, I just want to focus on two. I want to focus on that bargaining range and the too hot for proliferation range. Remember that if we're having too high of a power shift, too large of a power shift relative to the declining state's cost of war, the declining state finds war very uncostly. It's going to be very intolerant of any sort of power shift. If we're in this too hot sort of range, then the rising state knows that if it develops a nuclear weapon, the declining state will launch preventative war and intervene and stop the rising state from developing the nuclear weapon. So the rising state internalizes this and knows that it won't build a nuclear weapon without getting any preventative war launched against it, so it's just not going to build a nuclear weapon at all. And this is really good for the declining state because it means the declining state can offer no concessions and still get the rising state to accept. So up in this too hot for proliferation, we don't see any sort of concessions going to the rising state. If the declining state's unwilling to prevent, though, we end up in the situation down below in the green where we have bargaining, where the declining state is actually offering concessions to the rising state to get the rising state not to build nuclear weapons. Well, what's going on here is essentially in today, in 2013, we're in this range where the United States is unwilling to launch preventive war because we don't want to be fighting yet another war in the Middle East for, I guess, the third time in less than 12 years, right? So... Today, we don't, want to, we don't want to fight. We want to bargain. But Iran is worried about something. They're worried about our, our war exhaustion. So today, we're exhausted from war in the United States. We don't want to fight another war. But that's not going to be the case in the long term. So as the war exhaustion decreases in the United States, the United States is going to be finding preventive war more and more attractive. And so the United States is going to be willing to prevent under a wider range of circumstances. So essentially, Iran is really concerned that five years from now, we'll go from being in this green zone to this red zone. And think about what happens to Iran. As Iran moves from this green zone where it's getting concessions, right? The United States is trying to offer concessions right now. Iran's worried that five years from now, when the United States is once again willing to launch preventive war, that Iran will lose out on those concessions. And they'll be unable to get the concessions that the United States was trying to promise them today. And so think about this from Iran's standpoint. The alternatives are, look, if we have a nuclear weapon, it's going to be too late for that to make a difference, right? If we already have a nuclear weapon, if we're Iran, we already have a nuclear weapon, we don't even have to worry about the United States launching preventive war anymore because, hey, we've already had the nuclear weapon. There's nothing for them to prevent anymore. So Iran's decision is to accept bribes now like the United States wants and risk that the bribes will disappear as soon as U.S. war exhaustion disappears. Or, choice two, build the nuclear weapons now. Say, we don't want this deal. Pay the cost to build nuclear weapons and ensure that the United States will give concessions into the future. Because once Iran has those nuclear weapons, they will be getting the concessions. They don't need to trust the United States' word that it's going to offer concessions because it actually has the military power to enforce those concessions. And given those two alternatives, if you're a pessimist, you're probably going to be choosing option two because you're not going to trust the United States to continue offering those concessions purely based off of the possibility of potential power when the declining state, the United States, could instead force Iran not to build nuclear weapons out of the threat of a stick. So this threat of a stick is causing the United States to not offer concessions anymore, which is then sabotaging bargaining today. And that's what's forcing Iran to choose option two. So what's the policy implication here? Well, the current policy discussion in the United States focuses entirely on 
on the United States' credibility, or rather of, of Iranian credibility and Iranian commitment to the deal. We're not concerned at all about the United States' credibility to the deal. We just think automatically that the United States is going to uphold its end of the bargain in the long term. And instead, we're just we're focusing on Iran not wanting to break those those deals. We want to see if Iran is actually going to break those deals. Is Iran trustworthy in this? And what we need to understand is that going from what we talked about in the last lecture, commitment to or the, the Iranian side, Iranian commitment is really easy to obtain as long as the bribes are good enough. As long as we're willing to write large checks to Iran, Iran is not going to develop a nuclear weapon. But can the United States actually credibly commit to writing checks into the future? Well, that's the real source of the commitment issue. So the United States should spend more time discussing the credibility of its own offers. If we in the United States can't credibly convey to Iran that we're going to continue offering Iran concessions 10, 20 years from now, then Iran isn't going to listen to us and Iran's going to develop the nuclear weapon. So if we want to stop Iran, the only thing we can do in the United States is to stop getting this, this singular focus on Iranian credibility and start looking into a mirror and trying to figure out whether our own offers are credible to Iran. So that's something to think about. I hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you next time when we start talking about developing nuclear weapons in secret and what sort of, uh, what sort of issues that brings to this bargaining environment. So I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.